Aloha, and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Today we have a man who's very instrumental in my returning to the Catholic faith. We have Stephen Ray, Steve Ray on our show, uh, the author of Crossing the Tiber and other other great books, and we're going to be talking story with him. Really, because he's a world traveler, he leads pilgrimages all over the world, we're going to talk story a little bit today about what's going on these days, uh, the great tribulation that we're all experiencing. I'm not saying it's the great tribulation, but we're all experiencing that. And how do we respond to that, especially men? How do you lead your families? We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We've been watching the events unfold here, and though our, our radio show uh, tends to be evergreen, we don't normally talk about uh, topical type events, you know, current events. But something really uh, stunning is taking place in the Ukraine. And, you know, I am Ukrainian. I'm half Ukrainian. Uh, my grandfather uh, and grandmother came across on a boat during the persecution of Stalin, from Stalin, when about 10 million Ukrainians uh, starved to death when they took all their wheat and their and their uh, and their seed. This is what's interesting, um, and we pray for all those people there. And I don't want to just make this. It's just really interesting. What's happening right now is you're seeing uh, millions. It looks like uh, people fleeing the Ukraine towards freedom in the West. But what's really interesting is when you see the, the video of the people in Poland and the other countries, you see, you see women and you see children. You see young teenage boys. Uh, you see strollers. Uh, you see uh, uh, children with little stuffed animals. What you don't see is men uh, because the men went back to fight. And during this time when people talk about, I identify as a, as a male or I identify this or I identify that and all the gender confusion there's no confusion when 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 war breaks out the men know what they need to do the men the men uh, are going back into the Ukraine to fight and beyond that many of the U Ukrainian diaspora the men that have been around the world uh, with their lives uh, and families uh, you know living their lives in other countries are returning and more than that there are men that are joining from the some of the other countries that have been oppressed by Russia and so we see there's quite a difference. There's a stark difference between men and women. Men are doing their job. They, it breaks their heart. They escort their families to the border. And then they turn around and they go fight. So we have Stephen Ray with us today. Stephen has traveled all over the world. One of the things that when you travel the world is that you, get, you just fall in love with people. You realize when we speak about Russia, it's, it's the Russian dictators that, we, that uh, we're upset with. But, but people are... People are beautiful, you know, Ru Russian people are beautiful people. It's just that their leadership is, is evil. And, and so you have to have that perspective, that, that uh, perspective of, of that, you know, God created every single person, every single person that's dying on the fields of, of Ukraine, whether Ukrainian or, or Russian, are precious in God's sight. And, uh, and so we, what I want to ask Stephen about uh, right off the bat is uh, what is a man's response right now within the leadership of, of his own home as the families see what's going on? Uh, it's it's a time. It's a really interesting time because people look at at men and they go, "These are men. These are the men. These are the guys." Now the women are fighting too, but for the large part, it's the men that are going back into the battlefield. Steve, what do you say about what's going on right now? I like a statement I heard a while back that men go to war not because they hate what's in front of them but because they love what's behind them. We love our families, we love our country, and because we love what's behind us, we're willing to face the enemy and move forward. And, and it's not that we hate the people we're fighting necessarily, but we love the families and the church and our country behind us, and that's what's happening in Ukraine. It's just quite amazing and astounding to me that in this time and age, a country like Russia would just decide to take over a huge country like Ukraine and have millions of people being displaced and refugees. It's And the rest of the world is relatively helpless. I'm sitting here, I'm helpless. You're, you're part Ukrainian and you feel helpless too. I'm, 
I know the feeling of let's grab a gun and go help those guys, but that's on the other side of the world and it's not a possibility for me. And, um, you know, the whole, there's a lot of problems we face bear. And I, I've thought a lot about it because I have four kids that are very aware of what's going on. They're all older, married and with their families. I have 19 grandchildren now. And I realized that a hundred years ago, our life would have been different from the standpoint that we wouldn't have had mass communications. We wouldn't have had the internet. We wouldn't have had instantaneous news. Everything the Pope says, we hear about it before he finishes saying it. Even if the Pope sneezes, we hear about it. And we hear about Ukraine and all the evil things that are going on there. And we hear around the world and it, it can overwhelm us. It can do one of two things, I think. It can make us wounded and sad and almost incapacitated or it can make us numb so that we just stop caring because there's just such a avalanche of news all the time and bad news but we can become numb to other people's plight or we could become so consumed with it we just lose our even ability to function if a hundred years ago you and i wouldn't have been in this situation we would have been in our village you would have been in your city there where it's nice and warm in Hawaii and why I'm wearing a flannel shirt here because it's cold in Michigan. But we would not be overwhelmed with the news coming out of Ukraine with videos of families fleeing and bombs going off and people screaming. We would be very busy with our family. We would be out in the fields harvesting our fields yeah, and Ukrainians, taking care of our animals. Uh, yeah, my family were coal miners and, and wheat, wheat fields. Yeah. yeah. And we in our whole Catholic life, what would our Catholic life be? It's not worried about what's going on in Rome or what the Pope's saying or what the cardinals are going to do or the next synod coming up. We our whole Catholic life would be our local parish because mm -hmm. we would not we would be disconnected from the rest of the world. We're mm -hmm. just our local community, and we're living our Catholic life in our parish with our priest and our fellow Catholics, and we're taking care of our children, and we're mm -hmm. homeschooling them back in those days, pretty much. Yeah, and we're f taking care of the fields and what we do for a living, and I. Think I think in some ways it was much more human, much more healthy that way. And I've almost come to the point where I don't want to hear all the news. I, I do want to keep up on things, but we don't have television, and that's a big blessing. We got rid of television long ago, so we don't have CNN and Fox News and all of these just on constantly in our home. I get on the news. I get some good Catholic email things like uh, um, the loop and the Catholic thing and the crisis magazine. And I got to keep up what's going on, but I don't want to immerse myself in it 24 hours a day anymore. I want to be, have time for my kids and my grandkids. My mom's a hundred years old. I go visit her a, a couple times a week and read her stories. Um, I'm reading her the book, Heidi right now. Um, oh, that's we a just, great book. It is a great, we just I, finished know, reading Charlotte's web. You know, and these are books. She you read, read, have you read to book. her, um, Corey Ten Boom's book? Uh, she's read that herself, and I, a, I have that on my list of things to read if she lives it, long enough. It's a great book for people to read right now yeah. because of what's going on yeah. in the world. Yeah. Um, you know, the the uh, the situation, though, with what you've just described, in so many homes, the TVs are on and, uh, and the bad news is coming out. And we need to know what's going on. Uh, but we have to think about the children that are walking by or the little children or, the, or even our, our precious wives that's bombarding them and it's and it's and it's a cacophony of fear that's that's uh infusing itself into their soul and into their hearts and into their psyche and i think one thing men can do is just if you want to watch the news watch it by yourself you know maybe have a few minutes of it in the evening you don't need more than that but but turn down turn it protect your family from this bombardment of fear yeah, uh, the yeah. be the best thing that sells is is fear you know the, the a lot of the news isn't even news it's about what's going to happen and i was talking to one of my sons the other day he says i'm just so stressed out and i said jesus his name means i am who am salvation it he's i am who am the contraction from yahweh god is lives in the now and fear is pretty much usually about the future and yet god wants to say sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof deal with what you have right in front of you right now and live in joy because you're in relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is with you. And no, no you know, I, I know it's Socrates said no harm can come to a virtuous man because even a man who murders you 
it's their soul that gets affected, not yours. And so, it, you know, there's times when we think about reason and logic and faith and doctrine and truth, and then there's times when we just need to rest in hope and know that God's, yep. the Holy Spirit is in charge. We're talking with Stephen Ray. Just a joy for me to see you, Stephen. And, uh, and he's, Thank uh, you. Me and too. His book, uh, Crossing the Tiber, uh, was one of the two books that brought me back to the Catholic faith. Where can people find you, Steve? CatholicConvert.com. Oh, you mean online? Catholic. Yeah. Otherwise, if you want to find Steve Ray, it's where in the world is Steve Ray? In fact, the yes. first time we met, it was in Jerusalem. We just bumped into each other yeah. there. Uh, yeah. he's, he, I'm he on lead, my way back. He leads pilgrimages all over the world. We'll talk a little bit about that. But I just want to let you know, Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We'll be right yeah. back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel LeBoon Markham with another episode of Country Up. Bullfrogs. Toledo, Washington is a logging town in the shadows of Mount St. Helens, where work is tough and men and women are tougher. My latest visit to Toledo included the annual bullfrog jumping contest during the Toledo Cheese Days. My son-in-law Don, daughter Angela, and grandkids Duke and Callie had the duty during the nights preceding the jumping contest of catching the bullfrogs. Catching bullfrogs is my daughter's favorite sport after razor clam digging. Yep, you heard it right. And she's a stunning beauty of a school marm, too. Watching kids trying to goad their toads along by blowing on their rears and pounding on the ground was, well, more than amusing. For the kids, it's off the charts exciting. Later, I got thinking about this amusing scene and how it is similar to our walk with God. Figuring out God's ways is often like being bullfrogs out of water. We prefer the water, our primary habitat, but sometimes God wants us to walk, I mean hop into his habitat, which can be unfamiliar territory. That's why we need faith. We can't see God, but he's behind us, goading us along. The breath of God's Spirit sometimes blows on us as he urges us on to his path. We sometimes feel him blown on us, but we often stubbornly refuse to jump into the race of his life for us. I advise moving along before he starts pounding on the ground everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us so get off your duff and get in the race of life with god this is daniel laboon markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite, especially the men, uh, to join uh, Bear's Man Cave in the School of Manliness. You can go to our website, deepadventure.com, and you can become a member of Bear's Man Cave in the School of Manliness. And when you do that, you're invited to Zoom meetups every couple weeks with, with the other men, and you're also put made part of a smaller group, and you have Zoom meetups with them. And uh, it's basically, we're all bozos on the same bus. We're all a bunch of misfits like, like David's men in the cave of Adullam. You know, they were people that were owed money or running from the law, or I like to say maybe they were running for their mother-in-law. I don't know. But they're a bunch of misfits. But they formed each other, and God formed them into David's mighty men of valor. And I think also the school of the prophets, uh, Obadiah, uh, the, pro the, the 100 prophets uh, that were hidden in the caves, they, they formed each other. 
And so that's the man cave that we talk about. And then we have a three-year curriculum in the School of Manliness. And every month we go through one, one area of that curriculum uh, of the 36 months together. So we, if you start in the middle of the year, uh, you, still, you start with us where we are. And, uh, but what I, what's really begun to happen is the men are uh, getting their sons to go through the curriculum with them. And it's really beautiful. If you could see the way it's laid out with vi every month we have video, we have audio, we have written content, we have uh, uh, ca uh, assessments that you can do and ways of, of setting goals and getting traction in each area of your life, whether it's fitness or, or the virtue of fortitude or self-mastery and the, uh, things like that. Uh, we go through it together. And you need men need to be together with, with Stephen Ray who I just like being around. That's the only reason he said, what are you talking about? I said, Stephen, I just want to hang around you. So he's here. <laughs> and uh, but you're, you're about to take off for Stephen Ray, of course, crossing the Tiber and want someone who leads many pilgrimages. Where are you guys going? Well, this weekend, I'm going to the Oklahoma Men's Conference. I know you've spoken there, and I'm going to give a talk there. Giving Yourself to God is my talk. And then I come back, I do a parish mission, and the next day we leave for Italy. We're doing our Saints and Shrines of Italy. Teresa Tamio is coming with us. Oh, my goodness. And uh, we're going to start in Milan and work our way all the way south to Rome and then three days in Rome. As soon as I get home from that, I go out to Iowa and do a speaking tour, and then we jump on a plane and go back to Israel. We've got a sold-out bus in April and another sold-out bus in May. And I've got 10, believe it or not, Bear, 10 international pilgrimages this year already. Oh, now, and they're already I want to go with you all over the place. I would love to have you come with us. You, you know and what? You mentioned the cave of Adullam. Yes, right? I know. You, I know you have. A, you have. I know what you're going to tell me about. There it is. Did, did I show you these last? Time? Yes, I did. For those you know, of you who are, is, those of you who are not who are watch who are listening and not watching. Uh, he believe, Stephen Ray believes he's discovered the cave of Adullam. I think you have to sh tell him what you're holding in your hand. These are sling stones. These are actually sling stones. David used the ones on, in the brook, smooth stones. But they're a little the bit smaller soldiers, than a tennis ball, right? But bigger than yeah, a golf it's about ball. The, yeah, it's about the size of a tennis ball. And here's another one that's not broken. And this is a real one that I bought Amazing. it in an antiquity shop. And they chip them at night, so they make them round. And when they sling them, you know, they find a pile of these along the walls where they were, the soldiers are flinging them up against against the guys up on top. And wow. this one was in the cave of Adullam. And I and That's I, it was broken. That's absolutely amazing. And I'm convinced it's 3,000 years old from David's time because that's what those guys were using. And, you know, that, 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 that rock is broken. It shows you how hard-headed they were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't need to go there. But, uh, but you know, you're, so you're so – you're, uh, you're you're taking off for for Italy. I've never gotten to go up to the Milan area. I've always wanted to be to go by what what is the lake lake um what's what's the big lake up there? It just Sorry. slipped my mind. Yeah, <laughs> it slipped my mind too. I, I when I had my uh my bicycle where you would you know follow a trail online while you were sitting on your stationary bicycle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Lake, what yeah, is, lake Como. Yeah, yeah well, that's like, and that's um we're going to be right near there and um we're going we're gonna to see the great Duomo and the uh, remains of St. Ambrose, who is the guy oh, who brought uh, Augustine into I the love church. I love Ambrose. And, you got to take, you know, I asked yeah. uh, Michael D'Ambrosio, right? Are you related to him? And he said, well, I'm claiming it, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, so, so, so you go to, the, to where his remains are in, in Milan. Yep. I'm working on a documentary. The last of my 10-part series is going to be Doctors of the Church. So I'll be going back there with my filming crew next year to film Ambrose and Augustine and Athanasius I and love Egypt oh, and oh my all those oh, you're, guys. Really? You're going to go to, to, uh, to North, North Africa and film Algiers. where Athanasius was? Yeah. Are you going to go yeah. stand on a pole over there in the desert someplace? Not, one of, <laughs> some of those guys did that for 30 years, you know. But, uh, but what, what is the message you're going to be giving? Uh, you, you said, what was the message you're giving this, this week in Oklahoma? I think, what was it? It's called, called Giving Yourself to God. And, and it's not the kind of the, about stewardship, but not the kind that you normally hear in a parish when the bishop comes in and says, men, we have to have stewardship and you got to give money to the building fund and all. This is not a churchy topic. This is about these guys. And I'm going to say, first of all, it's, almost sounds crazy that we give ourselves to God. Why? Because he created us. So he already owns us. We're his. He made us. Just like as if I make something, if you go out and you get a piece of wood and you make a surfboard out of it, that surfboard is yours. 
the surfboard doesn't say, hey, I don't want to be yours anymore. I'm going to go do it. <laughs> no, you made it. It's yours. <laughs> and then we we broke away from God and decided to sin against him. And it's like the surfboard jumps up and hits you over the head and runs away. But God loved us so much that even though he owned us, he came back and died for us to buy us. So now he owns us twice by creation mm. and by redemption. So in a way, to say that you're going to give yourself to God is really a, a crazy thing to say because you already belong to him. But God wow. is a gentleman. Yeah. Yes. He's a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on us. He just stands back and he woos us like a lover woos his bride or his mm -hmm. girlfriend. And he woos us to come back to him. And he wants us to. And for us guys, you know, we may not like the wooing thing. We might like that he challenges us to come and join the battle with him. You know, people, guys, we talk about loving Jesus. You know, that's that's always been a thing. You know, it's easier for a woman to say, oh, I love Jesus. But for guys, you know, you know look at, hey, I'm loyal to him. I'm fond of him. I'll fight for him. I, I don't want to. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, by that? It's, you know, it's, in Hawaii, we use the word love a lot. Yeah, but I men, know. Men, and, men and are leery about saying they can't say "I love you" to their sons, and it's hard for them to say "I love you" to God. It's hard for them to pray out loud. Every time I talk to my son, I tell him I love him, Amen. and I tell him I'm proud of him. Every mm. time we talk, I mm. tell him I love you and I'm proud of you. Um, my dad did the same with me, mm. and us men need to be—we need to be tough, but we need to be tender-hearted too. And we need to be ready to tell our kids we're sorry when we make a mistake, and when tell them we love them, and grab nope. our teenage daughter and sit her on our lap and give her a big hug and tell her how beautiful well, she is. Yeah, and you know, the, you know, the Bible doesn't say God so loved the world that he felt all warm and gushy. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, your love is about that. <laughs> love, it takes a real tough, tough person to love, to really and love. And Jesus was tough love in the New Testament. He didn't go around gushy and mushy either, like some romantic guy. He made... Uh, he was tough on people. He was honest with them. And, and as people say, was Jesus nice? No, he wasn't nice. But he was loving, tough love, and he was caring. And sometimes he did things that didn't seem nice because he cared about. Like I said, you're, if I see you bear walking along towards a cliff and it's dark and I know in another 10 steps you're going to fall off the cliff, I'm going to run over and tackle you. And I, I, you I, I, even, I bet you wouldn't, Steve. I bet you wouldn't. Maybe everybody, would. anybody else. But for me, you just I let him go. <laughs> <laughs> and we may even break our arms in the tussle of me yeah, trying to yeah. knock you down. But And you'd say, that wasn't very nice, Steve. And I'd say, yeah, but look what could have happened. It was right. loving what I did, and it was right what I did, but not, right. not necessarily. And, and you were asking about families. The bottom line is well, my dad, we were talking about television, too, and my dad refused to get a television when I grew up. And I am the man I am today because of my dad. In the evenings, oh, you know what he did? Yeah. He didn't sit around watching the news and sports and spending all his time watching basketball and football. My dad spent his evenings reading stories to us boys. For, uh, let me just back up a little bit. My dad always had the same job for 35 years at Ford Motor Company. He never got promoted. And I didn't. Uh, we never had any money. We never went out to eat at nice restaurants. We never went on vacations mm -hmm. except when driving in the car. Yeah. Mom and dad never went on a cruise. And when I got older, I said, Dad, you were a really good employee. Henry Ford II hired you personally and even wow. came in to work to see you. He even came in and visited my dad. But my dad was never promoted. And I said, why, Dad? He said, I was, there's one reason, Steve. He said, they used to call me into the human resource office and say, Charlie, we've got a big promotion for you, big money. My dad has said, well, first, I got to ask a question. If I take this promotion, do I have to work weekends and evenings? And they said, of course. He said, then I have to turn you down. I have three boys at home that need me more than Henry Ford does. Wow. We're talking with Stephen Ray, uh, one, of, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, the author of Crossing the Tiber. That was, by the way, as you mentioned, your father. It was a letter to your father about why you're, you were yeah, converting right. uh, to the Catholic faith. Steve, where can people find you? CatholicConvert.com. And can I buy yep, that website, website from you? I've had people offer they want it. <laughs> I've had it for thir almost 30 years now. So. Wow. That's, that, that, that was before Al Gore invented the Internet. <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah we're, so we're, I've had that a long time, and I, I, I wouldn't sell it for anything now. Well, we'll be right back. We'll talk more with Stephen Ray. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha, and welcome to a Deep Adventure Moment. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. You know, when you paddle out in big waves, 
And I remember a big day surfing Rincon. It was such a big day that the pier at Ventura was basically destroyed. Boulders were being knocked about. And I paddled out and paddled out and paddled out. And then finally, it was like after 45 minutes, I couldn't get out. And then the cleanup set came and just drove me back towards the shore and threw me basically halfway up on the roadside of Pacific Coast Highway. There's a saying that the monks of the desert had, and that is, memore morte, remember your death. They took that from the Roman tradition when a general would go and win a great victory, they would allow him to come to Rome, leave his army north of the Rubicon, but he would come into the city of Rome and they would throw a great triumph for him and they would be acclaiming him and telling him how great he is. But just two paces behind them would be a slave or a servant saying, memore morte, memore morte. What does that mean? Remember your death, you're only mortal. The monks of the desert would live all by themselves and they would seek to go deeper with God and they would pray the Psalms. Maybe they would have a hold of one gospel that they could read, but almost all of them had a skull in their little cave. And when they got together, they may have mass or something like that. They wouldn't speak at all to each other except to say the words, memore morte, remember your death. We need to live our lives as if we're going to die. When we celebrate the feasts of the saints, we don't celebrate their, their biological birth. We celebrate their death. We celebrate their biological birth into heaven. We need to live every day remembering our death and longing for the beatific vision. This is Bear Wozniak from DeepAdventure.com. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, I got great news for me. I think it's for everybody else too. Sophia Institute is publishing three books for me uh, this year. They, they uh, published uh, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, which is out now. It's a great book for everyone in the family. It's a great book for, me, for, for uh, men's groups. It's good for fathers, as Stephen was saying, to read with their sons, because the chapters are five or six uh, pages, but we go through each of the virtues and some really great stories in there too, to help men get traction. I know uh, uh, when you think, what do I say to men? Well, talk to men about virtue, because that's something, especially the cardinal virtues of justice, self-mastery, fortitude, and prudence. And then of course, uh, faith, hope, and love, the theological virtues. And then the new book that's uh, uh, they're republishing right now is uh, uh, A Surfer's Guide to the Soul, A Surfing Guide to the Soul. It'll be out about the time this airs. And uh, it's where I use surfing uh, as a kind of a, a journey through um, an allegorical look at surfing and life in light of the uh, the pattern of, of Carmelite spirituality. So it's kind of, it, you wouldn't know it when you read it. You'd have no idea that's what I'm talking about because the idea isn't to, is my, the idea behind my books is uh, uh, in that book in particular is to cast a big net. But it's it's, it's a great uh, it's a really cool subject uh, a surfing guide. And then we'll be coming out with another book called. Uh, 12 Rules of Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? You know, Steve, we're talking about what's going on, uh, you know, in the world today. And in surfing, there's something called, and you said talk about how God owns you. Um, in surfing, there's certain people that have a reputation of snaking other people. And what that means is when you drop into a wave, you don't ride it straight. You ride along its face. Someone who then paddles in in front of you or where you're riding along its face, we call that person a snake. And that's what Satan did. He was a snake. 
He hopped on 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 uh, Christ's wave. He took what wasn't his, and even even Adam uh, in, da- in in Dante's uh, in Dante's Paradise, when when Dante asks him, you know, about that moment in heaven, he said, "I trespassed on God's territory." Uh, and so and so yeah. that 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 being a snake, taking what isn't yours, and so like when you said, when we give our lives to the Lord, we're just saying we're returning. <laughs> Uh, G- as Jesus said, recapitulation. I'm behold, I'm making all things new. When we get, when we surrender our lives to the Lord, we're just saying, "Here, Lord, I want to love you back. I'm coming back to you. Yeah. I'm giving you yeah. back. I'm not going to let Satan uh, snake me, and I'm not going to snake you, God." So, right, it's, and He owns us anyway. We're not. <laughs> he already owns us, so it's kind of silly to say we're going to give ourselves to Him. But, but he, because He's a gentleman, like we said, He doesn't force Himself on us. He really does leave us with free will so that we can say to Him, I love you, and I want to come back to you, and I want to obey you, and I want to fight for you, and I want to raise my family for you. But, he, but He's also called the Hound of Heaven. Yeah, He's unrelenting. <laughs> Oh. Is he like that He's guy, that, that person, that vegan friend of yours that just will never stop talking about being a vegan? You just go, well, you know the <laughs> thing about it though is 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 he is, he is the hound of heaven. He, he, he talk about how you know this. I personally hate cats. You know, I know there's a lot of cat lovers out there. <laughs> We're in the same. Club. I can't. I don't know what it is. Probably I had a bad experience as a child. But there's this 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 story I heard once of a man petting a cat. And the cat is just bristling, and it, and its its back is all arched up, and it just hates it. Every time the man pets it, he just hates it. And uh, and the man is just saying to the cat, "Turn around, cat," because he's he's petting it against the grain of of his fur, and he, the cat hates it. Oh, yeah. So when so often, I think in men, Jesus, as you said, is tough. He's not down at Starbucks reading poetry, you know. Like you know, why can't we all get along? That would be the title of his poem. You know, he's he 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 will be very direct and tough with men. He is the hound of heaven, and sometimes men right now, some of you are feeling that feeling of your, of uh, that that things are not right. Your circumstances are not working for you, and it's just the Lord saying to you, just turn around, and then and then this loving touch that I'm touching you with, which may seem like difficulties in your life, will become you begin to really understand. Uh, the hand of God in your life. So, what is what? What do you say to men who are at that point where they need to, they need to make a 180 degree turn? Well, I made that decision when I was 17, and I, I was a hippie kid back then. You know, this I was in high school during the 60s and the early 70s. I graduated in 73. I was 67 years old. You know, it's scary, Bear, to realize in 13 years I'll be 80. That'll That's be the, a- that'll be the oldest you've ever been. That's the oldest I'll ever, and it's only 13 years away. But I, I remember when I was 17, I was a hippie kid, long hair down on my shoulders and bell-bottom blue jeans. And, and we, I was thought, one of those we thought people, kids. people, we thought people would wear bell bottoms the rest of our lives, and we'd all have long hair the rest of our oh, lives. And and exactly. We didn't know it was, gonna, we didn't know it was a fad. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And I remember though, my mom had Billy Graham on the radio, and I oh, heard I him, him, and yeah. I just got overwhelmed with emotion, and I walked out on the country road. And I, with my long hair and bell-bottom blue jeans and all of my rebellion, and I said, I looked up at the stars and I said, Jesus, I'm only 17 years old, but tonight I'm going to give my whole life to you. I'm going to give every inch of my life to you from this day on. You're going to be my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to serve you. And I have not always done it so good every day, but at least that's the trajectory. That's the day where I just gave my life to Jesus. And I like to speak to a group of men now, and especially if there's young guys, and say, I recommend that all of you do what I did. Go out and look up at the stars. Realize how small you are Mm. and that you're not invincible. And you're going to die someday, not too long from now. Mm -hmm. I have a skull on my desk, and the skull talks to me every morning. And it tells me, in a few years, Steve Ray, you're going to look just like me. Memento what kind Moria. of choices are you going to make today? See? Yeah. And so this, wow. what I can say now at 67, because that was exactly 50 years ago that I did that, made that decision, that it was the best thing I ever did in my life. And he has never let me down. And even, even when you when let I him down? Through, even when you let him down? Even when I let him down. He didn't and let you down. And there were times where I thought the business, I've had several businesses, where I thought the business was going to collapse and I was going to lose everything. There would be at the last moment he would come in, and and I always knew it was the Lord involved. I never doubted that. So I said to my wife, "I'm never afraid of anything because I know the Lord will take care of us." You know my you know my my mom calls that. 
He's, she says Jesus is a swashbuckler. He I likes like to come in like one. Robert, like the like yeah. those old pirate, <laughs> Errol, like Flynn. I, Errol Flynn swings in on the <laughs> and with the sword because and, and or the cavalry yeah. uh, that, that comes in at the last moment to save yeah. the day, you know, yeah. with their horns blown. Sometimes because then you and know sometimes what, he leaves us so that we know it was him because if if he yeah. didn't wait till the last minute, we would have thought we did. Exactly, but he waits till the last minute. And, and does he do that because he wants to show off, or does he do that so that we can learn to trust him? Yep. And so, yeah, so, so often in ministry, you know, you look like you're going to uh, running into a brick wall and suddenly the wall crumbles in front of you. Yep. Yep. I think that's exactly right. And, and men need to, when you say put Jesus first in their life, what you're saying is, is that I know there's somebody bigger than me and he's in charge of everything and I'm not in charge of everything. And I'm in, I will do the best I can with my sphere of influence, with what I can do, but I have to put myself and my family in God's hands because he's much bigger and tougher than I am and much smarter than I am. And he's always looking out for my good, even when right. something seems like it's not good. And right. I may say, God, what the heck are you doing? What are you doing like, wrong, God? <laughs> yes. Can I give you some advice up there? You know, but all things um, work. To, well, all things work together for the yes. good for those who are called uh, according to God's purposes. And, and Stephen, Romans I was, eight twenty eight. Absolutely, <laughs> Romans eight twenty eight. One, one of the first Bible verses I, I memorized. But I was nineteen yeah. when I had that moment of saying, "Lord, I I, I, I want to give you." all that I am and I felt that beautiful powerful infusion of of God's Holy Spirit in my life and I have to say I wasn't always faithful that I had my up and downs but a lot of what yep. I went through was God prying my 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 hands loose from my agendas like Moses having to throw down his rod you know I I I, I, cl- I had agendas of course I'm a young man and I had a lot of failings but I like the fact that you said you looked up and though you, you know, so I, I had the exact, exact same experience I talk about it in my book a surfing guide to the soul I was at the beach I was probably about 13, and I saw these way, and I was building sandcastles. Every day I would build a really fortress-type sandcastle that I didn't, and wait for the high tide to come and see if it could withstand it. In the morning, it would be, <laughs> it would be gone, right? It would be gone. Uh, and, I, and I thought, these waves that I'm seeing right now have been breaking here for thousands of years. And when I'm gone, they're going to be breaking. And, yeah. and, then I, and I, so I had a sense of eternity. And then I saw a sailboat sail over the horizon. You know, that really high sailboat, high, high masted sailboat. Eventually it disappeared over the horizon. I had a sense of infinity, you know, like you said, you looked up at the stars. And by the way, the word desire means to look up at the stars. And suddenly I felt small, but I didn't feel insignificant. I felt, well, whoever created this, I really knew that whoever created this, this ocean um, and, and, and this earth and this cosmos created it so that I could be alive that that yep. that uh, ontological sort of sense of the arrow being shot across time and space and at that moment i from that moment i began to really wanting to get to, to find god i didn't find him then but it was like that kind of uh, the holy grail that moment of seeing the holy grail and pursuing it and then when i was 19 i had that conversion experience and my life hasn't has never been the same. I haven't always been faithful, but God is always. When, when you were, yeah. you know, if you if, if you are faithful, if, if you are unfaithful, I'm always faithful. If you deny me, I will deny you because I cannot deny myself. We're talking with Stephen Ray. What's your website again, Steve? CatholicConvert.com. Easy to remember. I'm a Catholic convert. Can I buy it? Not the no. website, but you can buy the stuff on it. No, I have, I have, I do have my store there and our pilgrimages, but also uh, I have hundreds of pages of free resources and conversion stories and things that people can print out. I don't have a copyright on it. There's, uh, there's letters I wrote in arguing with Baptist ministers and everything about the Eucharist and Mary. All that I've put up there so people can use it for free. And that's that's CatholicConvert.com. We're talking with Steve yep. Ray. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We'll be right back. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. 
We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus, you have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to let everybody know our TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak, our motorcycle TV show, um, is on EWT, and I believe it's on Thursday nights. And But also, you can become a member of the Mama Bears or the Man Cave, and you get access to all of the Long Ride Home episodes. Right now we have 20, excuse me, 25 episodes up on, uh, on our, uh, for those members uh, to view. And you can power watch them with your families uh, because they're on there. It's a, a secret YouTube link, so you can you know uh, stream it through your television if you want to. And and uh, right now EWTN only has twenty three episodes, so you get to see it a year before they come out. Or you can go to Prime Video, and you can watch a long ride home with Bear Wozniak. There, uh, we're talking with Steve Ray. Uh, I always say the author of the book Crossing the Tiber, but you've written many other books. I know some of them. Uh, you have a, a great fondness for uh, the early church fathers. Uh, I do, and the, for scripture, scripture and the early church fathers. In fact, my next book will come out later this year by Ignatius Press. It's about 500 pages. It's a commentary on Genesis. So it goes through the book of Genesis, um, paragraph by paragraph. Wow, and you love the Old Testament. You love it. Oh, I love yeah, the Old me Testament. Too. If you don't understand Genesis, you can't understand the rest of the Bible because everything goes back to Genesis. That's the beginning of everything. So I love that. And I also have a commentary on the Gospel of John. Yeah. And I wrote Upon This Rock, which is St. Peter and the Primacy of Rome and Scripture and in the Early Church. Talk, to, I, us, talk, I, talk to us about that, this last segment, about the primacy of Peter, the primacy. Of, by the way, my wife's experience that we talked about, about that conversion experience. Yeah. Uh, when we were in Israel, she really, she had never really had that. She had been a Christian, but she had never really had that touch like that. And she thought maybe it'll be when she was in Mary's house where um, the Annunciation. But it was at the primacy of Peter where suddenly she was infused with ah. a beautiful. She can't talk about it because she can't talk without mm -hmm. crying about it. I tell us about the primacy of Peter. Yeah, tell us about the primacy of Peter. And go ahead. I'm sorry. That, that's a, a beautiful place right on the Sea of Galilee, and that's the, called the primacy of Peter Church because that's where Jesus said, feed my sheep and tend my lambs, and do you love me? Do you love me three times? And I give a talk there, and, and people are in tears at the end of the talk because I talk about Peter. But the book I wrote is because as a Baptist, we believe that uh, they, they decide, the apostles were really all just kind of lone rangers, went out and started their own churches, you know, and you could just start your own church anytime you want to. And when I was becoming Catholic, I realized that there was a history to our church. And I went back and started studying it and realized that right from the beginning, Peter was given a place of primacy in the church. Jesus gave him the keys of the kingdom, which meant he's making him his royal steward, like the second in command. And he's given him all of this authority. And th that was then handed on. Just that, look, he's given the keys to be in charge of the kingdom. Well, when Peter dies, do you throw the keys away? No, you hand the keys to a successor who's now in charge of the kingdom. And this is all the way down now to Pope Francis. And we've always had a man seated in the chair of St. Peter. And it's and interesting, I realized, from the beginning, it was, it was in Rome. And, yeah, and it was century. always in Rome. Yeah. Peter set it up there, and nobody doubted that. And that's what the book proves from the first eight centuries, the quotes from the early Christians. And even those who may not have liked what the Bishop of Rome said, they'd never argued that he didn't have the authority to say it. Nobody right. ever challenged the fact that the Bishop of Rome was the head of the church. Not until the Protestant Reformation, really. That's where the real 
well, opposition. The thing. enlightened age of enlightenment and the Protestant Reformation, all of that. You know, I'm my own man. I could do do whatever I want. You know, that yeah. whole attitude. Yeah. Everybody nowadays seems to be their own pope. Even within the Catholic Church, people go, "Well, I, I like this teaching and that teaching. I don't like that teaching and that teaching." We don't understand. You know, Jesus was a builder. You know, you know, in Israel. Technon, he was te- 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 tecton, tecton, tecton. Yeah, he was a builder. He wasn't that's probably not a carpenter. Honestly, he was probably worked with with rock. Stone. With you right. know, that's why I called Peter. You know, the rock. The only thing we know that Jesus actually built though was a church, and yeah. I guarantee you, he didn't just throw it haphazardly together and go, "Okay, guys." You know, he has a plan and he has a structure. He knows all about the cornerstone. He knows mm-hmm. all about the foundation. He's the one that told the parable, you don't build it on sand, you build it on a firm foundation. Mm. So he's a builder. And who taught him how to build? Is Joseph. It, yeah. Joseph taught him how to build. And when you saw Jesus, you saw Joseph. Because Joseph was the one. I bet you you have things that you do or say like your dad used to say or do. You know, oh, yeah. we, we have similarities. More, more every day, actually. I know. Yeah. <laughs> we have characteristics of our fathers. And so even when Jesus told the parables, my my guess is that Joseph taught Jesus those parables. Jesus didn't make them up. He's learning from his father, Joseph. But you're right. um, Jesus would have had tough hands. He was a builder and a carpenter, and he's building his church, and he knows how to do it. And that book I wrote upon this rock was showing the foundation of the church all the way back from Genesis. I go through Genesis, the whole Old Testament, New Testament, showing that a pope was anticipated. A pope was necessary. And we have some good popes and bad popes, some good-looking popes and ugly popes and smart popes and not we so have, smart we popes. Have popes but there's, we all, have, there's popes in hell. And but, there's yeah. all, but the popes have been the source of unity and God. The church is not about the pope. The church is about Jesus. Amen. And Amen. that's why I'm a Catholic. Well, the, right now, uh, there's so much concern about corruption in the church, and I don't want to really get into that. But but uh, what do you say to people who say, well, I, I can't be part of the this faith because of the... The evil corruption, you know, in the church. What, <laughs> well, good, great. I mean, that's a good I, question. I, I, that's a valid question. It is a good question. But a couple of things I'd say is when I told my wife that even if the Catholic Church was perfect, as soon as I join it, it's not going to be perfect anymore because yeah. I know me. Right. I'm going to be the the weak link in the chain. But also, you could say in our country, we lo- we love America. My American passport is one of my most valuable possessions when I come back. It really into is. The country. When you, and when you're overseas, and country, you're glad you have it. Our country's screwing up on a lot of things. We promote abortion more than anybody else. We promote pornography all over the world. And yet, I'm not going to say, well, you know what? America's such a corrupt and evil country that I'm not going to be an American citizen anymore. No, I love my country, and I'm going to stay here. And when there's problems, I'll fight to fix the problems. And I will express my loyalty because I do love this country. I'm a Catholic, and yes, there's problems in the Catholic Church, and there always will be because it's made up of people. And yet Jesus loves it. It's his bride. And if Jesus loves the church, I better be very, very careful before I'm complaining about it all the time. Can you imagine, Bear, uh, Jesus is up in the front of the church. And his bride is walking up the aisle. And people are saying, oh, she gained 10 pounds. Look at that. She's got a pimple on her nose. He's not going to be real happy at people criticizing his bride because he loves her. This is his church. And yes, because it's made of people, there's problems. But you don't leave the church because of the problems. You stay and you help fix them. You know, and I, I was I love Matt Swain. You know Matt, I'm sure. I love yeah, that good guy. guy. Yeah, Getting back guy. on my show. I'm on a, supposed to be on a show every Monday morning, but yeah, lately, him and I, I have kind of the same <laughs> hairdo. You know, <laughs> lately I've been sleeping in, I guess, because uh, it's such a big time difference. I have to get up at three in the morning to be on a show. But but he talked yeah. about how uh, how he 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 became a Christian, <laughs> and then he more and more defined his doctrine. Uh, you know, left that church to go to a smaller church with more, well, you know, more and more. And finally, he said he was just had his own church. And so many yeah. Christians don't even go to church anymore. What, what about that? Yeah. The, what about that? Uh, cer- there, there, that circumstance where you have so many Lone Rangers out there. That's a dangerous thing to be, isn't it? Well, it is because everybody, uh, what, Jesus intended there to be one church, and that would be an institutional church where there would be teachers and it would a uh, tradition and, and there would be j- courts and legislature, everything. It's like a city. It's a government. It really it's a is. Kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. It's his kingdom. 
and it's not a democracy. But what happened now is we want to we don't believe in kingdoms anymore. We want democracies. And so Christians now think they can go out and just start their own churches. What do we got now? 30, 40,000 different denominations. You hand somebody a Bible, they become an instant theologian and they start their own church. Yeah, they, <laughs> and that's way. And, you know, Bear, this is what I realized when I became Catholic is that Americans choose their churches like they choose their restaurants. On yes. Monday morning, yes. I go by and there's Pizza Hut, Burger King, KFC. And there's, I say and there's to my brunch. wife, what do you feel where like? Are we gonna have, where should we go to church? Where yeah. should we go for what brunch? What do you feel like, dear? And my wife said, I feel like a hamburger. Okay, great. We'll get a hamburger. Maybe tomorrow she'll feel like a pizza. And then when Sunday morning comes and we drive down, there's Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever. Or maybe we'll just stay home and have our own church. So what do I feel like today? And we choose our churches like we choose our restaurants. Never even thinking, did Jesus actually start a church? And if he did, where is it? What is the address? And is it still teaching what he wants it to teach? Has it changed? And that's how te- I found How it. dramatically has the Catholic Church's teaching changed since the DDK? It had. It, it, we develop doctrine, let's put it that way. We have not changed the teaching. The things that were immoral back then are still immoral. The, you know what? There's still a trinity. There's still a two, two natures of Christ. You know, and the but, Eucharist, I, the Eucharist, the central. Right. You know what, Steve, can you, will you come back after you go to Israel? Can we get you back in the show? We've already run out of time. We oh, my goodness. We didn't, have a, we didn't have a dramatic ending. We ran out of time. I think, it's, I think we have. Let me see. Yes, we have run out of time. Um, well, I'd love to come back. Just send me an email. I'll join you anytime. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and have, a, have a great time in Oklahoma with the men there and in Italy with Teresa. Tell her aloha for us. Yeah. And uh, when, you, when you go on to, uh, to, to Israel, to the Holy Lands again. God bless you. Keep up the good work there. You're a busy guy. I didn't, you know, all these <laughs> movies you're making and books you're writing. And, and I have my, and, and I, caves, and I, and so. yeah, it's. And I, radio shows you're a busy guy. But, Keep but, up but, the good but, work. God but bless it's not you. fractured energy, Steve. We're, you and I, we both, we're all going in the same direction. Everything. We are. The, the point yep. of the spear is always in the same direction. This is Bear Wozniak uh, with the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Until next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.